Disclaimer. Please check your playback settings. Ensure you are listening to this podcast at normal speed. Unless you want us to sound drunk. Then play at half speed. Thank you. Ah, out of here. Why do I smell like gasoline? Video conference activated. Great job, Josh! You got us fired before we even got interviewed! That's gotta be some sort of record. That's sarcasm. You know our track record with the undead? Do I have to replay our Maniac Cop episode? <sighs> this never would have happened if Dan were still alive. Ah, uh, I know. God, I can almost hear him now. Uh, Tom? Josh? No, I can almost hear him too. Hey, is anyone there? Hello? Wait, I think I can hear him! Oh my god, I, I think he's coming from around his desk to- holy shit. Is that... Dan? Guys, guys, I can barely see you. Are you there? Can either of you hear me? We're here, Dan! Dan! What the hell happened to you? What do you mean, what happened? You strapped me to a jetpack and shot me into a ravine. What happened? We know that, but how are you talking to us like this? This is making no sense! Uh, Zencaster, dude. I'm barely able to get through, but it is getting through. Thank God I've got a signal all the way down here. Down here? Oh God, Dan. I am so sorry. I never expected that this would happen to you, of all people. You tied me to an Acme rocket. How did you think this was going to turn out? Well, and you say it like that. Ugh, look, it's fine. Whatever. Look, can you guys at least get me out of here? Sure thing, buddy. What do you need us to do so that your soul can be... Free? What the hell are you talking about, Josh? What the hell are you talking about, Josh? <gasps> Is that a crow on my desk? People once believed that when someone dies, a crow carries their soul to the land of the dead. But sometimes, something so bad happens that a terrible sadness is carried with it, and the soul can't rest. Then, sometimes, just sometimes, the crow can bring that soul back to put the wrong things right. What? what? Dan's come back as a crow. What? No! Oh my god, I think you're right! It makes perfect sense! No, no, it does not make perfect sense. I'm not dead, I'm not a crow. Oh my god, he doesn't even realize what's happened. Don't worry, buddy, we'll fix you right away. Just tell us what unfinished business you still have, and we'll get right on it. Oh my god, I'm talking to you from my computer. Move the damn bird away from the screen so you can see me. <laughs> Crow Dan is typing something! I am not the goddamn crow for fuck's sake! Video conference terminated. <sighs> At least the rocks are dry enough. It shouldn't be too hard to climb out. <sighs> yeah, let's watch a movie, guys. Are you troubled by a strange Sylvester Stallone in Demolition Man in the middle of the night? Do you experience feelings of Grandel Bush in Maniac Cop 3 in your basement? Or Robert Davi in License to Kill in your attic? Have you or your family ever seen a spook, Spectre, or Timothy Dalton in The Rocketeer? If you've ever followed Joe Polito into The Crow, then don't wait another minute. Pick up the phone and call the professionals. Ernie Hudson in Ghostbusters Afterlife. We're ready to believe you. This is it. The final chapter of Season 2 of The Fire Pit. The Marshmallow Man March to the Afterlife. Step on through to the other side at firepitpodcast.com as Dan, Tom, and Josh take you towards the podcast's final and inevitable resting place. Ghostbusters Afterlife. It spooks, specters, ghosts, and it's here every Tuesday at The Fire Pit. We're ready to believe you. Good evening, bots and listeners, and welcome back to the Fire Pit. I'm Tom, goth name Buzzard Nova. Ooh, I like that one. And we welcome you back after our Thanksgiving break. Since we're all stuffed with turkey and pie, it's now time to continue our Marshmallow Man March to the Afterlife. So far, we've been frozen in time, harassed by zombies, fed to sharks, launched into the stratosphere while Nazis chased us, and tonight, who knows? 
but we'll find out. As per our rules, we've taken an actor or actress from our last film and moved them on to this one. Now, to tell us about who we're watching and what we're watching, I'll send things over to Dan. Thank you, Tom. Welcome back, everyone. Dan here, goth named Midnight Pelican. Ooh, that is a good one. And last time, we saw Timothy Dalton turn Nazi spy and fly his blimp over L.A. trying to steal a rocket pack invented by Howard Hughes. If it sounds crazy, it actually wasn't, because John Polito informed all of us during the movie that it was all part of the show. And tonight, we'll follow John Polito to 1994's The Crow, a movie about death, revenge, drugs, rock and roll, and setting the city of Detroit on fire. So it could have taken place yesterday, for all we know. Um... <laughs> But to uh, give us a little more of a rundown of the film, I'll turn the mic over to Josh. Why, thank you, Dan. Josh here, goth name Stormy Daniels. And as... (laughs) Say the line, as it was written. Oh, goth name Stormy Sparrow. (laughs) Excuse me. (laughs) I don't think you want to get the two mixed up. I'm I'm just saying. (laughs) I'm just saying. My mind went somewhere else, by God. (laughs) Everyone's did. (laughs) Uh, And as mentioned, tonight we're watching The Crow, the 1994 movie based on the graphic novel of the same name. Also starring one Brandon Lee, Ernie Hudson, Michael Wincock, Tony Todd, and Bay Ling. The movie launched a pseudo-franchise, but none of the other movies have ever reached cult status like this one, and the TV show only lasted a season or two. I don't know. So, The Crow, released May 13th, 1994. Now, there's some asterisk stuff on this one, but domestically it made $50 million, but there are some other reports saying that it made about $44 million uh, internationally. But this being the 90s, nobody cared back then. Box Office Mojo, which is usually our primary source for information, for box office info, doesn't report in international, but we have conflicting sources elsewhere. But everybody does agree that domestically, The Crow pulled in $50 million. Which so is the pretty go good ahead. still with a twenty three million dollar budget. Well, it depends on if they uh, back then the whole budget and the advertising was a thing too. Good mm. point. I mean, it, it got a sequel. What year did the sequel come out? Mm. August thirtieth, nineteen ninety six. That one had a budget of thirteen million dollars and only grossed seventeen point nine million domestically. So even given all the stuff about this movie, this did not gross very much mm. relative to its box office, but. It uh, did premiere at number one its opening weekend, pulling in $11.7 million. And it was released in May of 1994. There was some fun movies that weekend. Trying to see if there was a good one I can do. Oh, this was a favorite film of mine growing up. It does not hold up, but it was a movie about three ninjas in sixth place. Do you guys care to take a whack at it? Is it the sequel to Three Ninjas? Three Ninjas Knuckle Up or whatever it was called? No, I think that was Three Ninjas Kick Back was the sequel. But I don't Tom think... Tom is correct in release order. Yes. Three Ninjas Kick Back was the sequel to Three Ninjas. It was actually on a second week of release in 94. I know there's it's four fun. Three Ninjas movies. Yeah, and what's funny is they recorded like the fourth one second, the third one third, but they recorded the second one fourth. And it had almost an entirely different cast every time. Huh. Today I learned a thing. Uh, and I realize I know way more Three Ninjas trivia than I probably should. Ah, speaking of Three Ninjas trivia. Oh. The, four, the fourth Three Ninjas movie starred one Hulk Hogan as the bad guy. I believe it was called like High Noon on Mega Mountain or Thunder Mountain or something like that. Something like that, yeah. 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 So th- that movie came out in 1998 or 97. Hulk Hogan was in the middle of a renaissance of his wrestling career as Hollywood Hogan when he had turned heel and famously started the NWO with Kevin Nash and Scott Hall. During that story arc of the NWO, Sting, the wrestler, also went through a little bit of a renaissance and Scott Hall was the one that gave him an idea that you should recreate your character as kind of dark and brooding to fight the NWO. And Sting took inspiration from this film and started to paint his face the same way Eric Draven paints his face in this movie and wear a long trench coat to the ring like Eric Draven does in this movie. So yes, I thought that was kind of a funny little six degrees of separation there. That was like 12 degrees but I'll allow it. 
So we're we we're saying that we can thank the Three Ninjas franchise for Sting becoming the Sting of the '90s. Possibly, we're, uh, mostly. We're, we're gonna thank the Three Ninjas franchise for having cast Hulk Hogan in a movie and completely unrelated to his uh, tenure in the WCW. Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Moving so, on. <laughs> number two in the box office on its third week of release was When a Man Loves a Woman. When and number a man three. Loves a woman. Okay, carry on. Sorry. We apologize. No, it's okay. It's okay. We had listeners. But um, <laughs> we're not featured in <laughs> At number three was Spike Lee's Crooklyn. At number four was With Honors. And at number five was Four Weddings and a Funeral. I have seen. No films on the top five of yeah, this. Not, not to take anything away from The Crow, because I actually think this is a pretty decent movie, and I'll get to that when we get to expectations, but um, that was a shitty goddamn weekend. At the that was. Office. Oh, my God. Like, I'm looking at this, <laughs> and I'm like, I know I recognize Four Weddings and a Funeral and The yeah. Crow. I've never even heard of it. Well, I recognize When a Man Loves a Woman, but again, I've not seen any of those films. And yeah. uh, Oh, my God. The, okay, now I remember with honors. That's the one with Joe Pesci and Brendan Fraser. Uh, Brent, Joe Pesci plays like the hobo. Oh, my God. That was that one. Yeah, I've yeah. seen that movie. Yeah, I like that movie. Um, I, I like Four Weddings and a Funeral, but the God, rest. That's one of those. That movie goes in like my category or the category for me. Like I've seen that movie, but I have no idea what it was called. I do now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I remember that movie. Yeah. I hope we can watch that movie sometime. I like that one. Yeah. I, yeah. Sorry. I derailed you a bit again. Carry on, sir. No, really? <laughs> but uh, at number six was Three Ninjas Kickback. Uh, other notables was on its 22nd week of release at number 10 was Schindler's List. On its eighth week of release and 14th was D2, The Mighty Ducks. Oh, uh, yes. Ooh, that movie actually came up on one of my lists. Uh-huh. When that, uh, that, that movie is a good one because it's when they, they go to the Olympics, not Olympics. The World or Peace s- Games or something like that. Something. Yeah, yeah, that made no sense. I don't think Probably because they weren't allowed to call, say, Olympics. I'm sure there's a trademark involved. Probably. Yeah. And Disney didn't, couldn't want to pay it or something. But at number 15, on its 21st week of release, was Philadelphia. The, that's the movie where Tom Hanks won his first Oscar, isn't it? Yes. Yes, also a good movie. And at number 16, on its 15th week of release, was Ace Ventura, Pet Detective. 17, was, on its 7th week of release, was Major League 2. Oof. Yeah, that's that's the uh, okay. Oof. The less said about that one, the better. Yeah, there's not a lot more. There's Naked Gun, thirty three and a third on nineteenth. A million to one. I forget what that one was about. No idea. It sounds familiar. Oh, that's right. That's the one about the Mexican immigrant who uh, he's an illegal, well, undocumented worker, and uh, he like he's selling oranges and. A millionaire drives up, gives him a check for a million dollars, and drives off. Interesting premise. I want to say I saw it, but I don't remember anything about it. But that's all for this incredibly lengthy box office section. So um, i have clearly taking notes from Tom. Tom, what do you have for the production? Well, speaking of lengthy, Josh, boy, do I have some production for you. Because we're going to be watching The Crow tagline. Believe in angels. Summary. A man brutally murdered comes back to life as an undead Avenger. Not the Marvel one. Of his and his fiance's murder. The Crow is, as was noted earlier, adapted from the 1989 comic book by James O'Barr. Um, the comic itself had been published uh, by at least five different comic companies through the years before it was finally adapted to film. Uh, The film itself was nominated for several MTV movie awards, winning for best song, and has since gone on to be something of a cult classic, spawning several sequels, as noted. A television series, which I modestly remember and remember fondly, and if rumors are to be true, if rumors are true, excuse me, a reboot starring Jason Momoa is set to come out soon. I like honestly I'm not, I'm okay with seeing Jason Momoa as the crow. I think he's probably going to be a bad guy in that one, to be honest. I, I I'm don't honestly see... okay seeing Jason Momoa in anything. Yeah. Like he wasn't the worst part of the Conan the Barbarian reboot. I've never no, seen the Conan movie. He wasn't and he was the best part of Aquaman. Yes, yes, and yes. Also, he's really good in Dune. 
I like him in Dune. Phil. Yeah, I've liked him since Stargate Atlanta, so I'll watch just about anything that he's in. Same, same. But this is not about Jason Momoa. This is about The Crow. But whenever, whenever he makes a um, remake of that, we will definitely talk about him. But this film was produced by Edward Pressman, backer of such dramatic and cult classic films as Conan the Barbarian, the original one, Masters of the Universe, American Psycho, and Wall Street. The film itself was written by David J. Shaw and John Shirley and directed by Alex Proyas and stars Brandon Lee, Ernie Hudson, and Michael Wincott. Um, in terms of behind the scenes, neither Alex, David, or John had any real experience. Hey, hey before Tom, this. Tom, yes. Tom, 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 yes. Tom, Tom, yes. yes, Nigel. Brandon Lee, Ernie Hudson, and Michael Wincott, what are they? Two Pete's. Yes, he said the line. <laughs> yeah, Dan kind of is jumping a little bit ahead. <laughs> I, but yes, all three of these individuals uh, we have seen twice in some capacity, and I'm going to note them fairly soon. Um, but again, back to... I hate that. That's my catchphrase. <laughs> okay, but out, none of the uh, people who wrote or directed this had any experience um, working films before this. Alex Proyas was exclusively a music video director. Uh, he did Rick Springfield's Honeymoon in Beirut and Fleetwood Mac's Everywhere, um, among a bunch of others. And I'm sure everyone who's listening to it is like, oh, my God, I know that music video. Sarcasm. You, you don't. You don't. Except maybe our 40 and 50 year old listeners. There you go. In terms of the uh, adaptation, yeah, the people who were brought in to adapt the screenplay um wouldn't have been anyone else's first choice either. John Shirley was exclusively television and animated series, uh, working on such one-season wonders as Brave Star and RoboCop animated series and live action. And the only thing David Shaw ever did was Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2 and Critters 3 and 4. So in terms of behind the camera... We, we don't have a lot of people who know what the hell they're doing. But in front of the camera, like I said, we've got villains, heroes, and everyone in between uh, who were kind of, let's just put it politely, talent bought cheaply. I know I've used that crack before, but it's, it keeps happening. For our rising star, we have Brandon Lee playing the main character, Eric Draven, which I never would have caught this had I not seen it spelled out is one period away from being Eric D. Raven. Hmm. He would Eric the Raven. It's it's such a punny comic book name. I kind of hate it and I kind of love it. But Brandon Lee has a unique distinction and honor on this podcast. Would anyone care to tell the listeners why Brandon Lee is such an important person to this podcast? Well, the prototype episodes, the ones that we've didn't record and didn't publish in probably better for that. Um, it started with uh, this whole thing started with us watching a movie called showdown in little Tokyo uh, starring Brandon Lee and Dolph Lundgren and uh, the guy who played Tatsu from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And um, while we were watching that um, we came up, I think it was Josh was the one that proposed the idea that uh, the next movie we watch should star somebody from, showdown in little tokyo so we debated should we watch the crow or rocky four because you know lundgren's in rocky four or whatever and then we we're like oh, teenage mutant ninja turtles because then we saw the guy from tatsu we saw tatsu we're like oh we should do teenage mutant ninja turtles next so we did ninja turtles and then we watched ninja turtles 2 and then we followed ernie reyes to the rundown and the rest as they say is history so our podcast kind of started with brandon lee yeah, so first time published on the podcast but spiritually our second our two pete yes he said it there again it he did it again yeah and, and he did it unprompted i i i i've kind of just i'm leaning back and accepting it now but um of course playing the support character slash audience avatar in this film about paranormal revenge is everyone's favorite paranormal audience avatar every man Ernie Hudson, who's playing ex... Well, I think he... Is he an ex-cop in this, or is he a, just a cop? He's, he's a cop who's an ex-detective. He got demoted. 
Ah, thank you. I wasn't sure. My memory is playing tricks on me. So he's playing Albrecht. Hudson, as noted, is our two-peat, having played Winston Zedmore in the Ghostbusters franchise, Ghostbusters 2 specifically for us. He's actually had a pretty good career. He's had, He has like 250 acting credits to his name, ranging from Miss Congeniality to Airheads to the Pound Puppies cartoon from the 80s and the HBO prison TV series Oz. It's, it's a joke, but it's true. If there's a steady paycheck, he'll act in whatever you want him to. And for our villain top dollar we have michael wincott another two pete a character actor who has gotten quite good at playing very bad people dan you might recognize him from a favorite movie of ours that we were considering watching it in the future and hope to watch do you remember this film he played a prison guard what movie what who's this again michael wincott he had all the time in the world oh uh no i don't remember Oh, wait. Shawshank? He, no, we've seen Shawshank. It does involve a prison, though. He was a prison guard. Uh, I'm drawing a blank. Uh, he played the prison guard Durliac in the 2002 film Count of Monte Cristo. He was oh, the one that kept good, torturing yes. Edmond Dante. It's like, it's like, you know, I have all the time in the world. It's like, God's not here and all that such. He also played um, Guy of Grisborne in Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. You know, Which makes... Which makes him a two Pete. Yes. yes. He did it again. Why why a he, spoon, cousin? He three peated the two Pete. Well, uh, thank God there's not any more people on this list. Um Oh wait, there's John Polito. He's our connector. So so he's uh he was in um The Rocketeer. The Rocketeer. So he's a two Pete. Yeah, I even put in my uh my script here that I was not going to say any of those two peats, but I wound up saying them anyways. So Dan wins. I have mentioned every two peat that is now in this movie, and now that we know what went into the, making this film, Nigel, what trivia do you have? Nothing. There's no trivia at all or behind the scenes stories at all on this movie. It was an easy production. Nothing went wrong. Everyone had a happy ending. The happiest of happy endings. No, God, no. You know, this movie's heartbreaking to read stuff about. Mostly because everyone knows what happened in this film. Brandon Lee was accidentally killed on set. Um, well, he, he died at the hospital, but he was he was injured on set with a prop gun. Um, I don't quite know exactly how prop guns work, but they pack like a powder and some paper into it. That way it has the, the sound effect and it has the... Um, explosion from the barrel of the gun well unfortunately someone had packed it i guess wrong and it fired out of the barrel too fast and it hit brandon lee and i think it hit him in a vital area in his abdomen and he later bled out so it's it's a very heartbreaking tragic story that unfortunately has come back in a, the worst way possible in more recent news, but we are not going to hit that low hanging fruit here on the podcast to make Alec Baldwin jokes, which the memes have been going all over the internet. And so if you want to see Alec Baldwin jokes, just, just go to Reddit. There's plenty of them there. Um, yeah. We're going to yeah. stay away from them here because somebody actually died and that's just not funny. But uh, yeah, so that, that's, that's the biggest trivia about this is that Brandon Lee was accidentally killed and it's, it's a damn shame because when he was killed, he was kind of a rising star. He had just made a movie called Rapid. Well, Showdown in Little Tokyo was a little bit of a cult classic or a cult mm -hmm. film. It wasn't a big hit, but it was it was like when it went when it went to video and, and it was on syndicated TV, it was making the rounds. People liked it. Um, it was a stupid little action film. And I think that was our consensus when we watched it. Mm -hmm. Accurate. Yeah. And then he goes and makes Rapid Fire, I think, in 1993 or early 94. He made Rapid Fire, which kind of sort of started to solidify him as an action star, kind of the next big martial arty 90s hero. Um, and then uh, he goes to make this film, which was going to be his breakout role. And he was tragically killed on set. And that is heartbreaking because it you do kind of wonder what might have been, because there's been so many rumors that Brandon Lee's been linked to Keanu Reeves, his character in The Matrix, or... Um, he was, he's been linked to, um, just other roles that have gone to other actors down the line. And you kind of wonder what his career might've been like, had that not happened in this film. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And double tragedy too. Cause his dad had died. Bruce Lee had died on the yes. set. That was like game of death or something. I think I yeah. can't remember, but yeah. 
also died on set. Yeah, it's 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 a I tragedy. I didn't think he died on set. I thought he died while filming a movie, but not on set. I, it's been years since I. It was different out. though because I don't think Bruce Lee, his father, I don't think Bruce Lee was killed with an on set accident. This is yeah. yeah. And what makes these kinds of tragedies, this prop gun accident, the same thing with the Alec Baldwin situation, is they're so preventable. Mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. they're so preventable to make, you know, I'm not going to get into a gun rights, gun safety debate here, but I'm just going to say these, these kinds of tragedies are preventable. Like there's someone in charge that has to check these things and make sure that these things aren't going to actually hurt somebody. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. unfortunately it killed Brandon Lee and it snuffed out an actor who was on the rise. And we really can only speculate on how his career trajectory would have gone. Had he not died making this film on the flip side of that, there's also arguments Would this film had been such a cult classic. If Brandon Lee hadn't died, because mm-hmm. that was part of the story going into this film. This was the film that, you know, there was even a lot of debate if they were even going to release this movie um, because Brandon Lee was killed on set. Um, yeah. Yeah. That, that was, that was going to, talk about that in my expectations yeah. on this film too and, yeah and, and he he was killed with about i i think from what i've read he was killed with about 75 percent of the movie filmed so they had to film the rest of it without him and i do have some bits of trivia about that most of the scenes after brandon lee's death were digitally composed there was in fact a mask that had been made directly from a mold of lee's face it had been intended for use on stunt doubles Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, They attempted to create scenes using the mask. However, the cast and crew were way too unsettled by that prop. So actually, (laughs) after this film was made, that prop was destroyed. It does not exist. They they just they destroyed that mold. That's a freaking death mask. Jesus God. Yeah. Yeah. And then and then to add to the tragedy of when I was saying these things are preventable. This is kind of infuriating and funny it's got a funny quip at the end but the story itself makes you wonder like how preventable could this accident have been according to empire magazine cocaine abuse was rampant on set mostly with the cameramen and the crew so they were shooting while they were high they were going into toilets to snort between shots one crew member recalls hearing the sound of a very loud sneeze on set one day and a very very annoyed brandon lee said someone just lost 50 bucks jesus fucking hell but you wonder like was you know, was the prop master or I don't know what they called. And I, I should know the term because it's actually been all over the news with the Alec Baldwin situation. But whoever the prop master is, that's in charge of guns and live fire and whatever on sets. You, you wonder, was he part of this crew that was doing cocaine? I'm not going to slander somebody on this podcast. I don't know. I do know that Brandon Lee's widow sued just about everybody involved in the production and settled for three or four million dollars, depending on. Who, what you read now that doesn't necessarily mean people were guilty but usually when you settle it's because you don't want other stuff coming out so yeah. so in terms of pounds to tons how much cocaine did you say you snorted that day <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah <laughs> yes yeah well let's just say they were filming a christmas special next door and they had a winter wonderland over there you know what i mean <laughs> so like i said that's most of the big story Mm-hmm. This this film ultimately snuffed out Brandon Lee's life, and we can really only wonder what his career trajectory would have been like had he survived. I'd like to think that he probably would have been a uh, upper mid card action star, maybe not in the same vein as as some, but you know he'd be well into making Expendables movies right now. And yeah, you know, yeah, instead of Jet Lee, it'd be Bruce Lee, or he'd be or with Brandon them. Lee. Durr. Yeah, or he'd be with him though. He'd be with, he'd be in a, the same movie with Jet Lee. He'd be making an Expendables movie with Stallone right now. You know, he'd be enjoying his quasi retirement, making Expendables films once every three or four years, and uh, it, everyone would love it. And I, I do. I also kind of like. I, I wonder about some of the sequels of The Crow that came out. You know, like mm-hmm. um, they weren't. None of them were nearly as as popular as this one, and or as memorable. So, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, although if we ever get to the Crow City of Angels, there is a ton of production trivia on that one. We're talking like tango and cash levels of stuff. So, you know, see what um, I can do then, for the next journey, guys. <laughs> and the last little thing I got is this is so unfortunate because I actually kind of like him as an actor, but it's it's thundering outside now as I'm talking about death. Um, he wasn't at fault for the death of Brandon Lee. That falls on the prop master. But Michael Massey stopped acting for a year because he was so traumatized by the act by the incident. Michael Massey is the guy who plays Fun Boy in this film. Mm-hmm. Um, his next film was a small role in Seven, 
1995. And up until his death in 2016, he said he'd never watched the film and still had nightmares up till the day he died of accidentally killing Brandon Lee. <sighs> yeah, that's something that's going to stick with you. Yeah. yeah. Fuck. Yeah. Um, he's a good actor, but he, he kind of he he took a he took a break, well deserved uh, after yeah. a year of a year after this incident, and never really had a big role after this. Uh, he had like a small role in Seven, and then if you look at his IMDb, it's a lot of TV credits after this. Yeah, and then, now that's not right. You make a good living in TV, but I can see why that this guy was uh, he was damaged, and he said he had so they said he had severe PTSD over this. Up till the day he died, he'd actually died in 2016, unfortunately. Yeah, so that's just really, really, really sad. This movie is sad. <laughs> this, is, this is sad trivia. Sad, sad trivia. So the Fire Pit Podcast. We're a comedy podcast. Honestly, and I tried. I tried finding something more lighthearted. And honestly, the only lighthearted one I could really find was brandon lee's comment about someone just lost 50 bucks when someone sneezed and they were doing all the cocaine on set well given that the whole uh that whole bit about this movie i don't think that you are going to get much out of it yeah yeah i mean i guess i could mention that that eric draven slash brandon lee misquotes edgar Allan poe when he confronts john polito's character in the pawn shop when he says suddenly i heard a tapping uh, the poem actually reads suddenly there came a tapping so uh but that's that's stupid and i'm not, you know, just, like i said i just i couldn't find anything super lighthearted like it, it, but then again it, it's hard to find something lighthearted when an actor literally died on set while making this film so uh that's all i got unfortunately i didn't end my trivia on a high note um but uh Okay, uh, you know what? I, I will say this. One little bit of trivia. The TV show starred the guy from the American version of Iron Chef, Mark Dacascos, who's also in Double Dragon, which also came up on the list that we were going to do. Danielle's favorite movie. Yes. Which we'll need to make a, a destination one day. Yeah. But yeah, Mark Mark Dacascos plays Eric Draven in the television show The Crow, and he's the host of the American version of Iron Chef. Okay. Is that on Disney Plus? How's that related to the MCU? Iron Chef... It's part of phase zero. It's it's multiverse. I'm so confused. <laughs> I'll, I'll break it. Yeah. I'll, when we meet up tomorrow night, I'll break it all down for you. Um, okay. Yeah. I'll show you the, the hidden scenes and all that stuff, but that's all I got. Um, so I guess well now we can just go into some expectations. Um, Tom, what are your expectations for this film? Have you seen this movie? Yeah. yeah. I, I saw this, oh God, I I rented this, I think, when I was in college or something like that. Um, I liked it when I saw it. I don't remember much about it, aside from, if you're going to get grim with it, I kept looking for the parts where it's like, where is Brandon Lee supposed to be, but he's not, because he's dead at this point when they're filming it's again very grim and i think a lot of people probably did that too when they first went to see it i honestly don't know how i'm going to feel about this film or uh, if i'm going to like it to be honest with you i liked it because it was kind of edgy and of course you know young college tom you know edgy that sort of thing that 90s just like black leather on everything knives drug use like just no extreme that's right that's what the 90s were about there was extreme it was spawn it was frank miller's dark knight it was all of that sort of comic book extra angst and i was into it when i was in my teens and my 20s i've think i've kind of grown out of that so as a adult who also deals with edgy teenage nieces and nephews i may not be as into all of it as i was before especially uh you know once the market comic books kind of became over inundated with that sort of aesthetic so i could be wrong though i just i know in the past films i really liked i go back to it's just they don't hold up as well i grant i saw this much later on um so hopefully it will age better but still i'm not sure how i'm going to feel about it i'm it may be a c plus film to me 
when I first saw it was an A plus. Uh, it might be a C plus, maybe inching into a D. Hopefully it's higher than that. But um, that's what I'm kind of expecting. Also, I'm hoping I can actually watch the film without being grim and trying to where's Waldo the scenes where Brandon Lee wasn't around to film them um, to put it bluntly what about you Nigel what are you expecting from this I'm assuming you've also seen it at least once many many times and I think um I I don't think it's as it's not as gothy or as edgy as you're kind of afraid it's going to be. I, I think as far as like nineties quote unquote goth movies, this one holds up a lot better than say The Craft. <laughs> <laughs> Which is this is this is the goth boys movie and the craft is the goth girls movie. But um, you know, I think this one holds up a little bit better than that one. But my expectations are I, I I'm pretty high on it. I, I like this film. In fact, and I don't think it is a typical comic book film because honestly, I didn't know it was a comic book movie until 10 years after I watched it. Oh shit. Yeah. I had no idea it was a comic book until a year, I, I, I years after it had come out. Yeah. So I think it was around the t- time, the fourth direct the, the fourth crow movie, which is direct to video, which actually starts Edward Furlong from the, uh, Terminator two movie. But, um, the fourth one, I think, with Kirsten Dunst and Edward Furlong was being made. And, and I remember it was in Toy Fair or, or um, uh, Wizard World magazine. And they were saying, you know, the fourth movie based on the graphic novel by. And I'm like, really? It was a graphic novel. So I had huh. no idea. Still never read it. I've never read the graphic novel, but I'm pretty high on it. I can't wait to watch it with you guys. I really like this film. This is one I've been looking forward to getting to. So that's my expectations are pretty high. What about you, Josh? Have you ever seen it? Uh, I have not. Oh, no. wow. On this list, I've only seen two movies on this list, and that was Demolition Man and The Rocketeer. Oh, nice. So, yeah. So the other four lit movies on this list are new to me. This is one that I've known about for years. I used to be a huge Bruce Lee fan, mm-hmm. and but I've never gotten around to watching this one. I don't think I've ever actually, prior to watching uh, Showdown Little Tokyo, I'd ever even seen a Brandon Lee film. But I don't really have much uh, expectations out of it. I'm hoping I will like it. I'm hoping to avoid, or I'm hoping that it's not one of those cringe things that you look, you watch and you're like, this would never fly today. Mm -hmm. But really, I don't think I know anybody who has anything bad to say about the film. Everybody I've ever talked to about it, which, yeah, it doesn't come up very often in conversation. Mm -hmm. But in the past, like in high school, as I was a young adult, whatnot, I never heard anybody say anything negative about it. That is true. I don't hear a whole lot of negative about this film either. I mean, it has an 83% on Rotten Tomatoes, but... You still do most of the Transformers films. No, they don't. <laughs> no, they don't. The only fresh Transformers film was Bumblebee. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, thank you, Internet. You give me hope. Oh, man. Yeah, they make a bucket. Of, they make buckets of money, but they are not beloved by Rotten Tomatoes. But yeah, overall, I'm looking forward to watching the movie, but I don't have any high expectations out of it. If I come out of this and I enjoy it, I'm good. Now, you were uh, rather... Catholic boy back in the day too, Josh. Did your parents have any opinions about this film and whether or not you as a young Josh would be allowed to watch it? Because I know my parents did. And that question is also to you, Nigel. My mom loves this film. Yeah, this movie came out in 94. I'd already seen like half a dozen rated R films by this point. So when trailers and such, you know, were happening, they would have been okay with it. They wouldn't have uh, been like never for this film for you. My parents never really had that kind of an attitude on things. So I I was never specifically banned from things. Like there was a couple of things during certain periods of my childhood. But like they went on a Simpsons riff at one point. But that lasted a weekend. Yeah, I never understood that either. My parents also were like, no Simpsons. And you look back to those early episodes and like, why not? It was a cartoon. (laughs) My parents love The Simpsons. My mom to this day loves The Simpsons. Yeah, it was a cartoon geared at adults that kids watch. Same, like I remember they banned me from watching The Simpsons, but I could watch Duckman all day long. <laughs> Wait, Duck, a Duckman minute. was worse. Yeah. It was like Duckman had way more like sex jokes and drugs jokes and yep. you know, uh, yeah, just. Oh, I, I rem- what's funny is I remember we used to go to church on Saturday nights. So I would come home and I would watch Duckman and Weird Science. I love Weird Science. 
that was an awesome show. And so was Duckman. But I never got told that I couldn't watch Duckman. Duckman has one of my told. favorite lines ever where they were going through the one town and the, the boy in the backseat of the car was like, I think the gene pool here could use a little chlorine. <laughs> I love that show. Why isn't that show on streaming? That's... There are probably reasons <laughs> as to that, that parents should have been aware of in the 90s. <laughs> yeah, my parents were like zero tolerance to that show. I'm pretty sure it would get canceled pretty quick in today's climate. No, my mom loves The Simpsons and my parents had no problems with letting me watch. In fact, I had a Bart Simpson shirt and everything. So I... I definitely my parents had no problems with Simpsons. and my mom loves this film my mom loves this movie yeah i don't know if my parents have seen this film or not so i'll have to quiz them on that yeah i know my parents were absolutely zero tolerance do not watch this film when i was younger i don't know other opinions about it now i'm pretty sure they've never watched it i'm guessing so, so uh, I think most, we've confirmed of this, that- uh, most of this kind of outrage is from people who've never seen it because mm-hmm. there's really only one kind of racy scene in this film that I could see where like, if, you know, I probably would let my nine year old kid watch this film, but yeah, if my kid was 13, it'd be all right. But, mm-hmm. um, it's, that's uh, the only, I can really only think of like one really racy scene and the violence in this movie is really not much more violent than most films in the MCU. Even Eric's quote unquote brutal death and all that stuff is is shot with shaky cam and the colors are distorted and the camera's distorted. So like it's not really graphic, you mm-hmm. know. Okay. Well, it was early nineties, so sensibilities were a little Well, I know. It's just the same yeah. it's the same people who say like Harry Potter is, you know, all about the occult. Have you ever actually read the books or watched any of the films? Because that's not the case. Well, semi relevant to um next week's movie. Well, the prequel to next week's movie. But uh, I remember one time somebody told me that Ghostbusters was of the devil because it uh, involved, you know, demons coming from hell and everything. Yeah. I mean, yeah, uh, th- there were cam- <laughs> there were campaigns in the 70s against Dungeons and Dragons. Um, yeah, dude. there, was- there were campaigns in the 90s. I remember I went to a church one time where I told people I played D&D and they looked at me like I had like a swastika carved into my forehead. Oh, I know. I know. I know. (laughs) Yeah. We, we had a lot of people in our uh, hometown, Dan and I did. My mom was one of them. I've, I'm learning that. I really, you two had the cool parents. I had the not cool parents. Love you, mom and dad. There was, when I worked at Buffalo wild wings as a wait, or as a, as a server for a long time ago, it was around the time that the reboot Masters of the Universe show was on Cartoon Network and I wouldn't miss an episode. I watched it all the time and I was talking to someone else at work about it. And we had this other girl that worked there that was very, very religious. And she says, Mm -hmm. you should watch that show. And I thought she was going to say, because it's a kid's cartoon meant to sell sell toys. That's probably why you shouldn't watch it. You're too old. The usual argument, you're too old to watch that stuff. No, we shouldn't watch it because it's blasphemous. Because He-Man calls himself the master of the universe. And there's only one master of the universe. And that is Jesus Christ. And you're like, Uh, you're like, I mean, maybe, but He-Man's pretty cool. (laughs) (laughs) Has, when does Jesus save, you know, uh, Castle Graveskull from the evil machinations of Skeletor? Thank you. Yeah. I mean, but she went on this like huge tirade about how like, you know, Masters of the Universe, the the very name of it is blasphemous. And I'm just like, what? And it's the first time I ever met someone like that. I thought they only existed in those crazy pamphlets that you found on the street when religious people hand them to you and someone else just throws it on the ground. So, like, no, she was like literally giving us this whole big spiel about how Masters of the Universe is blasphemous. And, and she would go off on other things, you know, being heretical and blasphemous and all this other stuff. And, and you're like, you guys just don't have any fun, do you? <laughs> just, they you don't. don't. They really don't. <laughs> yeah. like, what, what was that? Was it uh, Monty Python and the History of the World Part 1? They had a skit where it's like Moses came up. It's like, and these are the 15. And he trips, falls, one of them cracks and destroys 10 commandments. Yeah. yeah. Mel Somebody Brooks. Told me it's like Mel Brooks. Thank you. Somebody told me it's like, that's blasphemy. You should not be watching that. Right. Oh, my God. Right. And, and you know, yeah. And like I said, they had campaigns about, still to this day, have campaigns about Dungeons and Dragons. Churches organized book burnings for Harry Potter books and Lord of the Rings books. 
and uh, you know any other book that involves wizards and, and dragons and swords. That's and healthy. Yeah. So, so all like, those people probably would have loved this film. But that's the thing, though. Like, there's a stronger case for Harry Potter being in the occult than this film. This film doesn't really have a whole lot of occult imagery. This film doesn't have any devil worshiping other than the fact that they call the night that they're that takes place on Detroit. They call it devil's night, Mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. which is supposed to be the night before Halloween. And apparently they set fire to the whole city of Detroit. Lovely place that town. (laughs) So, well, it is cold around that time. So it's probably (laughs) the only thing they can do for warmth. Right. This is what happens when all the jobs went overseas, but, um, yeah, pearl clutching. I love pearl clutching. Yeah. Yeah. We have gone off on a tangent. (laughs) Yeah. You, Tom's going to have fun editing this. So. Yeah, we're going to have we went off on a tangent, but uh, I guess um, I think that's all that's all we've done with expectations. Yeah, I've, I've said everything I can say. I mean, Reginald, anything from you? Tom, play the music. Ah! Welcome back to another undying episode of The Fire Pit. I am. As always, your interspersal host, editor, and animal handler, Tom! Edgar wanna cracker? Edgar wanna- Ow! Ah! Fuck you too, bird! Ah! Ah! Yeah, you better run! Stupid bird. And thank you for taking flight with us here at the fire pit. We're rising from our graves to take care of some unfinished business during our march- Mellow Man march into the afterlife, sorting out the Devil's Day and Black Friday shopping before we reach our final stop, Ghostbusters Afterlife. Some brief disclaimers before we go forward. This has been the journey of technical difficulties, and this episode was no exception. There were some microphone issues from Josh's end during the watch, which resulted in his audio coming off sounding uh, old-timey, very tinny, if you will. These issues also affected the timing of our recordings. So much like our The Mummy episode back in the first season, the rest of our final thoughts had to be recorded live in the most echoey room available. So the quality is going to be noticeably different going forward after this point. Hopefully it doesn't impact the general enjoyment of the episode, but on behalf of the management, we apologize for the inconsistency and the inconvenience. Uh, Ask that you bear with us. We promise that later episodes will be more of what you expect, which is hopefully good. Also, While we're on subject of disclaimers and things coming down the pipe, we're going to be taking a brief holiday hiatus following this season, after which we'll be starting things off with our Q&A and retrospective episodes leading into Season 3. So, if you have any questions or general inquiries about us, past or future episodes, or the podcast in general, just feel free to leave them on Facebook or Discord or email them to us directly. You still have a few weeks to get yours in, so whatever you're wanting to ask, we'll be sure to answer within reason. But speaking of reason, let's see how our team is handling their very reasonable response to Dan's resurrection. Uh, <laughs> Alright, so stop me if you heard this one. Jesus Christ walks into a hotel. Stop. <laughs> Whoa. Whoa. What's that? Uh, is that gasoline I smell? <laughs> yeah, I had trouble with my jetpack. <laughs> yeah, if I had a dime. Can I get a coffee or something? Uh, and, a, and a hot dog. I'm starved. Two hot dogs. I'm starved. Sure thing. Oh, and a towel uh, when you get a chance. I am freaking soaked. Phone? Call the sucker. Calling Tom. A dick name never gets old. Your account has been disabled. Thank you for using AT&T and have a nice go fuck yourself. Eh, sounds about like AT&T's customer service. <sighs> Wait, why am I disconnected? Uh, do you know if any buses or taxis or anything runs through here? My phone's acting up. I'd rather not have to walk in this rain. Can't rain all the time, buddy. 
See? Look at that. Snow. What did I tell you? Oh, God, I hate snow. I hate everything about today. Say, weren't you supposed to be a clown or something? What? Your face. You got all this white shit all over. Oh, <laughs> I have a story for you, sir. I'm a huge Sting fan, by the way. Sting the wrestler, not the singer, although the singer's not bad. And I was, anyways, I was hitchhiking uh, with some sir, wrestlers. Sir, your, uh, your, your card's been declined. What? No, wait, of course it's declined. Why wouldn't it be? This has already been such a perfect week. Here, try my bank card. Yeah, account's been closed. You've got to be kidding me. You got a way to pay for that wiener? Hang on, I have some emergency cash in my glove box, in my car, which is back at the office. Oh, for fuck. Police! We got a report of identity theft for one Dan Nigel. I think, oh my god, how can everything be going wrong already? I just got here. Officer, look, there has to be a mistake. I'm Dan. Here's my license to prove it. Hmm. I'm gonna need you to come with me. Oh, God, this is hell. I'm in hell. I'm in hell. That's the only explanation for this. I'm actually dead, and I'm in hell. Uh, funny you should mention hell. It says here that you are dead. Oh, look at that. It's raining again. Can't rain all the time. <sighs> Tom, Josh, I don't know how you's done it, but I know you's done it. I, ow, that hurts. Hey, now it's snowing again. Told ya! Snow? In December? Tch. Yeah, that'll be the day. But if you want to spend your day telling people about the latest deals on your products, or if you want to take the day to say hello to someone special, or if you want to make our day with some journey recommendations, then feel free to email us at curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com that's curtain call entertainment inc at gmail.com. Just be sure to put fire pit in the subject line as well as why you're emailing. Whether it's to let us know about some trivia we overlooked in our previous movies, production details that you thought we should have covered, box office information that maybe we got wrong, or whatever have you, and sneak it into our mailbox. From there we'll read it, Resurrect it from the grave to avenge a terrible misdeed. Send it out to take vengeance against those who would do evil upon the innocent. And never respond. Resurrecting the dead to avenge the living is still technically considered accessory to murder. So uh, it's best we not have this trace back to us. But that email again is curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. Capital C. Capital C, capital E, capital I, at gmail.com. Well, look who's come back for more, eh? Have you learned your lesson, or am I gonna have to... Oh. Oh. I have a murder I need to deal with here. I'll let you get back to the episode. Thank you all for listening, and as always... Get... Oh, Jesus! And now to check on the team to see how they're enjoying their movie. Ow, oh, my knees. Thank God for healing factor. He's immortal. Are you really immortal if you're already dead? Well, I mean, you're like unkillable. But you're already dead, which is kind of the opposite of being alive. And immortal means live forever. So how can you live forever if you're dead? Well, then he's an undead guy. He's, un he's alive. If both of you don't stop, I'm going to bed. <laughs> <laughs> so it takes a year for him to get resurrected. Well, no one said it was an easy process. But Jesus did it in three days. Well, now you know why the Christians didn't like this movie. Also, power creep is a real thing. <laughs> You've lost so many <laughs> listeners with that comment. <laughs> I'm actually kind of enjoying the splicey little flashbacks instead of like a shit ton of exposition. Yeah, I, I do like how they're doing this right now. It's feeding it to us rather than just throwing it at us. In a topless Brandon Lee doesn't hurt. I love you. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> you said the quiet part out loud, kid Josh. Is this the victim? We found a detective and you missed it. I think you the order to move. He's dying. I don't think you have authority to say, no, let, let her die. She just let her die. She's fine. Victims, aren't we all?
This is dialogue I would have written when I was 17. Are you nuts? Walking into a gun? You high? Yes. You see the grave? Empty. Three out of four. God, he is just the coolest guy in every room he's in. I know. I love Tony Todd. He's just, like, the best. Yeah, his fight with Rowdy Roddy Piper in They Live is magnificent. I know. It's even better that that's Keith David, not Tony Todd. <laughs> Tom edit that out. You're bleeding all over the place. I thought, you know, you were invincible. I'm not anymore. When someone asks if you're a god, you say yes. Welcome to the first day of the rest of your suspension. For what? Misconduct. I'm a Detroit police officer. We don't even know the meaning of the word misconduct, let alone get suspended for it, sir. <laughs> I'm laughing because it's true. They actually don't have an entry in their laws about unnecessary force. All force is necessary. Shut up! We're trying to sleep! It's Detroit. It would just be gunfire. <laughs> Shit on me! I mean, it is Brandon Lee. I wouldn't say no. Shit! <laughs> on me. I don't know how much of this I can keep in, Josh. Uh, for fuck's sake, die, will you? Thanks. I like you, Michael Wincott. You and I are friends. Freeze! Shit. Are you some kind of a ghost? He's not afraid of no ghosts. Give me the girl, and I'll let you walk out of here. Why don't you just give me a minute to think about that, huh? Yeah. Also, remember, I can't be killed. So are you immortal? Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> and now, back to the episode. This is gonna sound really good in post. So we just watched, well we didn't just watch, if you're, we just watched yesterday, The Crow. Technically, we watched it today. Mm. You're absolutely the, right, yeah. Josh. Well, we finished it today. We started it last night. We started the episode last night. Yes. We didn't start actually watching it until, like, bright and early this morning. Technical but... difficulties were a reality, mm -hmm. uh, as yeah. always. We take a couple weeks off, we forget how to podcast. Mm -hmm. Or spell podcast. But it is special tonight, the second half of this episode. Because, uh, Nigel, do you want to explain it? Well, we are actually getting ready to go watch our feature film, or our feature uh, journey destination film. Uh, Ghostbusters Afterlife. So we are meeting in our dear editor Tom's apartment tonight to go see the movie here in a little bit. But we are going to record our final thoughts for The Crow tonight as a kind of a test bed here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we're in Tom's kitchen uh, recording on, on, on one mic. And this is actually the very first time the three of us are ever recording in the same room at the same time uh, during the same... Or not during the same film, but yes. So... I think we did do an episode where you and Tom were... Yep. At yeah, your... it was, uh, it was yeah. Um, The Mummy. The Mummy, the Mummy, uh, yeah. Of all yeah. the films, that would be... So, uh, well, semi. that was when your apartment almost burned down. Yes, that but was yes. a fun day. Yes. So, and I can already tell you that um, we're going to go back to the virtual thing because I hate looking at you guys. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'm yeah. already just pissed off at your opinions now. It's yeah. like... I know, I didn't... Yeah, I just... Wow. Wow, you two are so ugly. Oof. Yeah, but says, also it says Jesus. Yes, yeah, says Jesus. <laughs> Walmart Jesus, according to my nieces. <laughs> I this, say this is Jesus. accurate. Jesus, off wish. Yes. Now, now you're just being mean. <laughs> also, apologies uh, for weird sound stuff. Yeah, getting ready for this our inaugural um, was a lot of fun for me because I had the majority of the equipment and. Um, if you had noticed, there's like different sort of adapters for my mic stand that none of them fit. So yeah. we're using my podcast stand, which is on my dining room table, and it is wobbling anytime anyone breathes. So it's going to be a lot of wonka, 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 yeah, wonka. So, uh, also, um, we're recording or we're going to watch Ghostbusters Afterlife here in a little bit and uh, enjoy this podcast or Fire Pit Podcast Faithful. Because uh, going to see a movie in theaters as a destination film is not going to happen again for a while. And it's never happening on a holiday season ever again. Yes. But we, we've uh, done a lot of lead in for this. Um, we try to keep our hands off the table to avoid the bouncing. Yes, yes, yeah. yes, yes. <laughs> yes. See, now I can see Dan flipping me off. Normally I just know that he's doing it, like, inside. 
<laughs> but now I can see the finger. He's doing it. And the disapproving glances. We're never doing this again. <laughs> but I think before we go see Afterlife, let's talk about Eric Draven escaping the afterlife. Yes. In The Crow. And I do believe Josh is up first on Final Thoughts. Which is awesome. The film, which is actually, and this is also a different way of doing Final Thoughts because we've actually let the film percolate for a little, a little bit, bit yeah. before we mm-hmm. did it. So now I am kind of curious to hear how this goes. So Josh, why don't you lead us off with some final thoughts? Oh, the expectations. <laughs> now I got eyes on me. This is weird. I'm going to Normally I do this without pants. <laughs> no, okay. So, The Crow. Um this was my first time watching it. Um but it's one of those movies where I've heard about it from a lot of people. I've never heard a lot of negative thoughts about this movie. So, I was curious to see how I would take it in. I think overall I have a positive view of this movie. Like, it wasn't perfect. And obviously, it is definitely a product of the 90s. I don't know if I should make eye contact. This is weird. I know. It's like, <laughs> I don't know what to do with myself. I want to look at the mic. So, <laughs> I need to put googly eyes on it. But no, no, I, I liked the movie. It's not in my top 100, maybe. Mm-hmm, but, mm-hmm. Um, like, some of the special effects are definitely from the 90s. Like, especially oh. when, like, any of the, like, over the city scenes, the crows flying, or when, you know... Brandon Lee's rocking out on the uh, rooftops or whatever. See, just saying it sounds corny. <laughs> <laughs> it so was corny. Like, oh my god, the whole. <laughs> you like all that? Uh, what do they call that? ASMR. ASMR. Is it actual it podcast. Foley. 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 Yeah. <laughs> yeah. At least no one's chewing or anything. We mm-hmm. ate before we did this. Thank God. Yeah. I still have pizza over there. I can I can add some of that. Give them that real live podcast. I can feeling. go get a into a toy box or something, but. No, I like the movie. Like, seriously, though, some of the scenes, especially when Brandon Lee was interacting with, uh, what's his face? Fun Boy, I think his name was, which was the actor, or was the character that the actor was playing who accidentally shot him, gave me anxiety because it's like I knew the behind the scenes story, mm-hmm. which definitely made me more attentive to the movie. Like, you could definitely see the scenes where they didn't have Brandon Lee to film, and I thought they did a really good job of. The creative edits, um, the voiceovers, the hidden in the shadows. Um, it wasn't glaringly obvious. Like, if I remember, what was it? Uh, Game of Death with Bruce Lee. He re- filmed all of his fight scenes in that movie. Mm-hmm. But the guy they got to stand in, because he had the, that was the one where he had the yellow jumpsuit, right? No, though, that was um, um, something else. Uh, uh, Enter the, the Dragon. Enter the Dragon's only That was Enter the Dragon. I think, I sure, thought it was Game of Death. Uh, correct us, um, anyone listening right now. Yeah, I'll Google it whenever one of you guys are giving your thoughts. But it's like, you could, uh, no, he finished Game of You're Death. Right. Huh? Right. Yeah, Game of Death. it's Game of Death. Because Enter the Dragon was, um, he'd finished it, he died six days before the film came out. Okay, okay. So okay. he was filming Game of Death. It's like, the it scenes, he was running, but it was very creative edits, him running. But it was a guy who would, did not have... His stature, you could tell, like, from the jaw, it was not Bruce Lee. But then he runs into a room, they show the camera at the front, and it's Bruce Lee. And it's just like, that was not Bruce Lee, run, whatever. Mm -hmm. But this movie, they did a really good job. You couldn't tell at all that it wasn't Brandon Lee, but it was very obvious that it, you know, why aren't they showing his face in this scene type Mm -hmm. thing. But overall, I liked the movie. It was one of those really simple stories that we talk about. Mm -hmm. Like, he's literally coming back from the dead and killing the people who killed him. Mm-hmm. And then he's done. I'll have more stuff to pepper in here and there. So, but Nigel, what about you? You've seen this movie before, right? Dozens of times, many times. I've loved it every time. I still love it now. I agree with you that it's a product of the 90s. It definitely mm-hmm. feels like a 90s kind of film. And, but that's not a bad thing. I mean, you know, there's a lot of movies that are products of the 80s and they feel like 80s films, but they're fine. You know, um, same with movies that are products of the 70s and products of the 60s, you know, are perfectly fine. So... It being a product of the '90s to me is in the, is on that is on the good side of that spectrum of, of being a product of the '90s. Whereas like some movies that are products of the '90s, like uh, Hackers. Yeah. Oh okay. God. Hackers is also a product of the '90s, but is so dated that it's like this movie is definitely '90s. This movie's mm-hmm. not dated as badly. Like it's, mm-hmm. it's definitely '90s, but it's not so dated that you're like laughing at some of the stuff that's in the film. Mm-hmm. But um, I I love how. The movie is a simple revenge story, but it's kind of got some mystical kind of qualities to it. You know, the the crow bringing him back to life, the crow being the source of his powers. 
it makes it even more tragic that Brandon Lee died during this film because I think if he had lived and maybe they did a proper sequel to this film where he was still Eric Draven, they could have delved more into the mythology mm-hmm, mm-hmm. of the the crow part of it. You know, the crow being the source of his powers and mm-hmm, mm-hmm. are there evil versions of it? And I know the TV show did that, but we're not talking about the TV show. Like, are there evil versions of the crow? Do bad guys get to come back to life and be empowered by things? So Ooh, that is a good question. Yeah. So I just you know they could have delved more into it. I know that the the sequels are l- loosely tied to this movie, and the only reoccurring thing is the crow brings them back to life over totally horrible ways but that being said i still love this film i think a lot of it was creatively done i think they did the best they could with what they had especially after brandon lee was was killed um they you could definitely like i'm with you you could definitely tell the scenes where they don't have him Mm -hmm. to film because they're either filming him from the chest down or they're they're far away shots or his face is definitely masked in darkness yeah, and that just added to some of the tragedy of it. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm kind of repeating my thoughts on this film. I still love it, I, and I'll get into some more into when we get into some merge thoughts. Mm-hmm. But, uh, Tom, what about you? This movie sucked. Holy God. Shock of shocks. Didn't see that one coming. It's, it's This is a very bad film. Let me qualify this. It's, this was a bad film, very much so, but it was enjoyably cheesy bad. Most of the time I was thinking of it, not just because he kept setting the fucking fire crow thing up, and we even talked about that <laughs> yeah. during the watch. Like, yeah. this, yeah, we know where Daredevil got its inspiration from. No, the whole time I was thinking, this feels like Daredevil and Punisher Warzone. Yeah, and but those movies came out like 20 years later. But they still had that same feel. Even Dick Tracy, that exaggerated this is clearly a comic book movie we're going out of our way to let you know this is a comic book film it's hyper exaggerated so i wouldn't be surprised if some of those shots of him on the rooftop with the guitar weren't taking from the comic book i i, I think they were because they had the same backstory draven was a musician and all that in the comic yeah so book. i wouldn't be surprised like him like playing that guitar on the rooftop wasn't like there was a panel of that somewhere just hyper like exaggerated unreal I mean if Nigel hadn't looked up that Detroit does actually have a lot of gothic architecture I figured like is this downtown Gotham City did is someone cribbing from um um Dark Knight is this what's going on it just had that feel and the dialogue was just so corny it's like victim aren't we all staff? It's like, God damn, that is just so cheesy. Did Joss Whedon write that? He probably did. I mean, he was the go-to for most dialogue back in the day. I had fun with the movie. Let me, let me also say that. I had an absolute blast watching it. It was a fun movie to watch. But you're recognizing its flaws. It was oh, yeah. so got, corny. You, you've got to. Like oh, I'm not saying this movie's perfect. I love oh, no, this no, movie. No, I'd love it too. I, I would. Stuff? Def- yeah, 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 let's just jump okay. into merch. Okay. Yeah, like, I, I mean, I could go for days. I, that means before we go, actually, no, 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 I think it's um the acting also. It's like Brandon Lee knew to bring it, but that girl, that fucking girl. Yeah, that she's they, very wooden in the film. Oh, and, yeah. And yeah, she does bring down a lot of scenes. And, and you know, no disrespect to her per se. I, I think this was. One of her only acting roles, and definitely one of her first. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, she's supposed to be grieving these two people that meant so much to her in her life, and you just kind of—I don't know. She, I, I never got any mm-hmm. sense that she she really didn't have a whole lot of. I mean, she, again, she's a child actor, so or at the time she was a child actor, so I can't fault too much. But she had like no range as far as like yeah how she was giving those emotions off. It's like where Brandon Lee's like looked at the dialogues like. Victims, aren't we all? Really? Okay, fine. Action. Victims, aren't we all? He gave 100% yeah, she, it was but she very... was like, this is dumb. Well, I don't want to do this. No, it's like, I'm looking at her. Like, seriously, uh, The Crow was her only credit at the time. And she didn't act again until 2009. Really? Yeah. So, she was definitely the... Uh, weak point in terms of acting. Mm-hmm. She had the look. I'll give her that. Oh, yeah. She looked like a 90s kid. She, she, she had the look. The skateboard, that the beanie. Whole, the... Yeah. 
braided hair, like she said, the braided ponytail thing. And, yeah. And yeah. I would say of the acting, like I thought Ernie Hudson did a great job. I thought hey. Brandon Lee did a great job. Great job for the movie. Like I'm, I'm in the, I, 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 uh, I'm in the Venn diagram of with you there, Tom. Like, yeah, if I, these two movies were in a production of Hamlet, their performances would have been awful. But yes. this is the Crow. I'm gonna be like. Well, Ernie Hudson's been in a lot of lousy stuff before, and he he's has, still getting better. His performance, I'd say, was middle. It was there were some. I parts thought it was, was really good, good for the movie. Let's put it like this: it didn't detract from the movie. Watch for me. Like her acting pulled me out of the movie. Mm-hmm. Brandon Lee or anybody else's acting didn't pull me out of the movie. Yeah. Like you know, you have those instances. Like I know what is it? The um, God, that death sound that they have everything. The Wilhelm scream. The Wilhelm scream. Yeah, the Wilhelm scream. It's like nowadays, if like I hear that, it pulls me out of the movie. Yeah. It was one of those things. It was like that was the Easter egg that everybody listens for. But now it's like when you watch a movie and you hear it, you're like, okay. If I don't hear it in a Indiana Jones or a Star Wars film, because they they do show up in all of those films too. But that's mm-hmm. I'm listening for it in the Indiana Jones and the Star Wars. Yeah, movies. but <laughs> like I don't. It didn't pull me out of the movie. But like this movie was one of those ones I thought that was like really I said it did a good job for what it was. It wasn't anything that I'm gonna like. It's not gonna win any Academy Awards. I don't think it would be a success if it came out today. Oh, definitely not. Well, well actually, I don't know. I was thinking about that. If if the remake, if I was to be in charge of the remake of this film, and I don't normally recommend this, this movie needed a little bit more blood. Yes. Well, this like, movie should have. Uh, this movie was a hard R because of the language, but the violence in this film isn't. It isn't that much more violent than most MCU movies are. No, so, no, but, you know, yeah, well, and there's a lot of gun. No, there's gunfights and knives and all that stuff. But you yeah, but they don't have like scenes where uh, knives are like poking out of a dude's chest yeah. and hair and the drug use too. Yeah, it was like you have someone no. who is like a thousand fucking mm. drug needles sticking. Yeah, like, I'm, I'm saying. I'm, let me let me let me qualify what I meant by that. I don't think if this movie as it was as in it was released today, I don't think it would be a success. I think the concept behind the movie, if it was released today, could be a success. Oh, it has been a success. I mean, this movie, I mean, the, the, that's another thing, I guess, for my thoughts too. There was no plot to this movie. There was no there story. There's a the, revenge plot. He wakes up a year later, which I have problems with, but it's neither here nor there. Um, but and then he just goes on a roaring rampage to prevent. There's no motivations for him well there's no story progress there there's no motivations really for the villains except to be villains that's another thing that bothered me i mean what's with the evictions yeah they're they just bad just... to be bad yeah there was no uh, point they it. explained that the big bad guy top dollar was getting trying to get the people up because he's trying to buy up all the real estate yeah but he had a year and then when we show up to him it's like he's done nothing with the real estate and he's complaining like everyone's burning down the city this time let's just do a super burn he's he... well the plot only works if you don't overthink it yeah tom come on <laughs> jeez <laughs> put it on a t-shirt <laughs> no 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 i get what you're saying tom like i said there's there's plot holes big enough you could drive a Mack truck through. I mean, you know. <laughs> yeah. No, no, I correct you, Nigel. There was no plot. Therefore, there was no no okay. holes for you to drive anything through. This, well, this okay. is just this movie is just a better looking uh, version of Spawn in terms of the main characters. Better. I will say this: Spawn. this movie was a better Batman movie that came out in 1994. Batman Forever was the oh, next Batman. Oh, that was. Movie, so, yeah, yeah. That was right. Oh, that that yeah. was that. Right. Yeah, you're, you're right. That was <laughs> low bar though. <laughs> low, low bar. Low bar. But I mean, tit for tat, this movie is almost Spawn. It, Spawn took cribbed a lot from. Oh, um, again, we go back to that. Blade cribbed a lot from this. Punisher War Zone. I'm remembering the scene from Punisher War Zone where like you had he's chasing those hardcore parkour guys and he just rocket launchers one right out of the air. It's like there should have been that scene in this movie. Yeah. Had there been a sequel, there would have been him rocket launching some dude who's hardcore parkouring. On a uh, budget, it was like it was pretty much even a shoestring budget for an action film, an action film based on a comic book movie getting only twenty six million dollars to play with. That's that's kind of a tight budget for that kind of movie. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, think about that is not an era of comic book movies yeah. making a lot of money. Now, so, plot no, wise, yeah, yeah, acting yeah. wise, we've talked about those flaws, but I will say this. I loved a lot of the direction of this film. Mm-hmm. I like the way the story was told, what little story was told. Like, I love the fact that the flashbacks were very mm-hmm. short and mm-hmm. concise mm-hmm. and they weren't full of a lot of expositions, nor were the flashbacks these really lengthy scenes that are, that kind of go on too long and, 
I think if they'd have done a full scene, after about five minutes of it, you would have been like, okay, we get it. They were madly in love and they were tragically killed. Like, we get it. But yeah. the fact that they get them in these short little bursts makes it establish that, yes, they were madly in love and they were tragically killed. And Brandon, or not Brandon, Eric Draven's going to kill all these mofos. <laughs> and it's <laughs> rightfully so. I think if they'd have just done these really long, extended flashbacks, by the end of the film, you've been like, fuck, I would want to kill him too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know. It gets the emotions across. Like, boom. Yeah, a lot mm-hmm. of complaints about, you know, killing care- loved ones especially, especially it's like you don't give them like characterization or like a, like were they a person neither of them are really people mm-hmm. in this regard mm-hmm. it's like who knew what Dr- Eric Draven was like before this they yeah, were yeah. both fridged so the audience would feel bad enough for them so we would mm-hmm. root for him to murder those bastards yeah, you don't know if he, he could have you know been selling drugs to kids he was a musician I mean come on <laughs> <laughs> I mean in Detroit in yeah. Detroit in the 90s yeah, I, I like I said, and I also like the contrast of the movie was very dark, lots of shadows, lots of um, grays and, you know, dark blacks. And then the flashbacks were very colorful, shot in almost like red tint. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Um, the actors were lit differently so that their skin tone was more vibrant in the flashback scenes as opposed to the yeah. modern day settings. Apparently the director wanted to film the movie in black and white and use the flashback scenes where it was supposed to be in color but the rest of the movie was going to be in black and white Ooh. I think if I've not read the comic or the graphic novel but I think the original print of the graphic novel was kind of like that so in that Sin City kind of vibe where only certain things were colorized or whatever yeah yeah and I think the director wanted to film most of the movie in black and white and then do the flashback scenes in color but apparently the the studio or, or producers or someone said no we don't really want to do that because it would have cost more because they would have had to use different types of film and all that stuff. So plus for the audience, then where comic book movies were still Biff Sam Pow, no one they needed to appeal to a broader audience. Yeah. yeah, I think you could, you might be able to get away with that today. I think if you you try that today, because it's but well, Sin City was a success. Yeah, Sin City Two was, I and mean, what was the other movie that was kind of sort of like that? Sh- no, 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 that was the Frank Miller directed one. Um, the, not Samuel, the Shadow, but no, no, the almost, Spirit. The, the Spirit, Spirit yeah. yeah, which was dog awful, but in a in, in much like the Crows, just over exaggerated bad. Logan had a black and white release too. Yeah, it and, wasn't filmed to be black and white, but they did release it. Yeah, black and and, white. and people liked it. You know, yeah. so well, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Um, but I I. I thought that that was a nice touch, though. That the most of the modern day part of the movie is it, mostly at night. They, I can't think of any scenes in the movie that are in the day, um, except for the one scene where he's burning where the, one, the pictures and stuff. Yeah, when he was burning the pictures, that was during the day. And when what's her name, the Sarah, the girl, woke up and her mom was downstairs cooking breakfast. Yeah, or, that was in the daytime. Yeah, but most of this movie takes place at night, and so the movie's shot with a lot of like you said, dark blacks, mm. grays, silvers, well, yeah. and things like that. And then the flashbacks are these. Really vibrant colors. Plus, I think uh, when his wife shows up to take him to the afterlife, I think there was a it was like that sunrise. Was was yeah, and she's lit differently too. When his when his wife or girlfriend's coming back to take him back before he finds out Sarah's been yeah, uh, yeah kidnapped, yeah. she comes back the way um she's lit in that scene. Like her, she's wearing that white nightgown or a white gown looking thing, and that's projecting big time or like you know reflecting. And then her her like said so she's lit so differently so that you can see like her her skin tone is, is yeah she's yeah the way they she almost looks like an angel I guess that's probably the, I think that's the, what they were the, I was about to say yeah. I was like she's yeah, supposed yeah. to be the angel coming to take him yes yeah. but I mean given like you know all these criticisms and everything I mean they're warranted um, I would definitely say that this movie would have had significant issues had it gone on for more than an hour and 37 minutes agreed it oh yeah it was cut it, I think it well, was edited at just the right mm-hmm. length you know it was it was a good movie and like you said if it was just over an hour and a half and if it had been any longer than that it would have been Mm-hmm. Having some serious problems. Yeah, yeah. I derided the fact that they chose a, a music video director for this, but I think he he was right. I he think did. they did good. Like I said, it's it's one of those things. Everything about the movie was slightly above average. You know, how I, when I talk about the James Cameron movies, I'm like, okay, this is at a nine, this is at a nine, this is at an eight, this is at a ten, this is at yeah. a ten. I think this one is similar to that. Where everything is still highly ranked, but like on IMDb, it gets a 7.6 out of 10. <laughs> so I would say that everything about this movie ranges at peaking at an 8, but its lowest is a 6. Ten, there's nothing about this movie that I would give a 10 if I was to break it down into every, everything. I would give nothing a 10, but I would give everything between an 8 and a 6. I, I think that's fair, too. Like I said, I don't think it's a bad film. 
It's not a good film. You'll be entertained watching it. It will not change your life. It's a, <laughs> you know? it's a cheesy film. I put it up where with uh, oh God, how many other cheesy films have we seen? It's it's not Tango and Cash though. Oh no, nothing's no, that. Nothing good. will ever be Tango. And no, Cash. no. I think if we ever do like Avengers Endgame on this podcast, it's not going to be Tango and Cash. No. Yes, uh, I'm, I'm trying to figure where I would put this in other comic book films that I've seen because it is kind of unfair to compare it to. I think uh, it's other slightly films. better. I think it's if if we were just to compared to other comic book movies i think it's better than daredevil i think it's better than punisher warzone i don't think it's as good as 89 batman it's not nearly it's not as good as anything the mcu's done except captain marvel i might put this above thor well most of thor but oh i would definitely put it above thor like what was the second one called the dark Dark world World. yeah i would definitely put it above dark world i like the dark world but i'll admit that it's one of the worst of the mcu movies yeah but Mm -hmm. i I would put it up there but it's it's better than like the early like the the 90s marvel movies not the mcu with the the fantastic fours the daredevils (laughs) Um, yeah those some of the x-men sequels were pretty awful Mm-hmm. Um, I would put the crow above them. Yeah, it's not as good as um, it's the Dark Knight or Batman Begins. Slightly or... above mediocre. Yeah. yeah, yeah. This one has style to it. Yeah. Those others were felt generic. This one felt like it was trying to be something. Like least. I would almostly, I'd almost want to say that I would probably put this above the Amazing Spider-Man. You point out that was a pure money grab. It's like they threw as much money as that as they could without any thought to the actual movie. Because they needed a release of Spider-Man movie. Or mm-hmm. else the, Mar- the rights would have gone back yeah. to Marvel. I would say that this movie is better than The Amazing Spider-Man. But I would put them close. I would put them very close. But I would still I'd give this movie the edge. Because like the things that made Spider-Man good was money. Right, so the things that made this good was just no one trusted them. They didn't expect yeah. anything from them. So they just... Did their own thing. Yeah, exactly. I wonder. I, I wonder if the last act of the film would have been better if Brandon Lee hadn't been killed. Because apparently he was killed with seventy five percent of the movie filmed, so they had to film a good chunk of it without him in it. Yeah, yeah and I you could if... tell in that final, fu- not the final fight, because um, he was there to film most of that. The big showdown in Top Dollars gang hideout when they're all shooting and he's flying around with katana blades and all that other stuff brandon lee's not in a lot of that scene you could tell the by the way the actor the the body double that's fighting is not as fluid with his martial arts moves as brandon lee was earlier in the film when Mm -hmm. he was fighting um Mm -hmm. when he fought the 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 pin cushion the guy who turned into a pin cushion i can't remember the the, I can't remember. I know they were Tintin. 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 Yeah. Tintin, yeah. Tintin. Jolly yeah. pirate gang with jolly pirate nicknames. I love yeah. that line. But yeah, when he fights Tintin, that's Brandon Lee, and his his martial arts moves are much much more fluid. Mm-hmm. And we we saw that in Showdown Little Tokyo. He was a martial artist. He could you know well, I mean his, look who his dad was. And same with uh, you guys haven't seen it, but I've seen the movie Rapid Fire, which he that was his one of his first action roles. Brandon Lee's a martial artist. He can fight. He had really good you know, stage fighting presence. And the actor doing his fight in that big scene with Top Dollar's hideout isn't Brandon Lee in all the shots. And you could just tell that they're having him do basic yeah. moves, like clothes lines or grabbing guys and throwing them or shooting guns. Yeah. You know, yeah. Like he just resorts to shooting guns because, you know, he can't really do much else. It's a shame. I just wonder if the, the last act would have That's been That's what I was better. wondering, too, is like myself, like, because you look at the movie, and it feels like they did wrap it up pretty quickly. Because, I mean, it's an hour and a half long in an era when two hour long movies was becoming a very big thing. Because it felt like they, that last third act was very... Or I, just, I wonder if the fight choreography would have been a little bit better. Or, like you said, it does kind of feel like they rushed the ending because Brandon Lee's not there anymore. So we kind of need to do with what we can. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. But now we, we do say that the movie as it stands now is perfectly fine at an hour and a half plus mm-hmm. a couple of minutes. But if it had been, but Brandon Lee hadn't been killed and they had more to work with, would it be fine at two hours? Would that version of the movie have been fine at two hours? We'll never know. So, yeah. you know, you know I honestly don't think this movie would have done as well if he hadn't been killed. If I'm going to be cynical, like I think a lot of people did. It's like the son of Bruce Lee died making this movie. I'm going to go see it now. And that's yeah. also sad because I don't know. What could have been, what would have been, what should have been. Eh. But I've said all I can say about it. Uh, I think we're going in circles now. So. Yeah, a little yeah. bit. Yeah, I could nitpick some more, and I've been known to. But, no, I've hit everything, so and that's tonight's show. Our live version of this show. As a reminder, you can find us on firepitpodcast.com. 
Um, you can find links to it on Spotify, iTunes, Amazon, or wherever fine podcasts are sold. Our regular episodes are Tuesdays at 6 p.m. Please like and subscribe to whatever medium you choose. We really appreciate it as it really helps us out. And uh, when you get a chance while you're looking at it, uh, be sure to subscribe to us. Um, why do you subscribe to us? Or if you don't subscribe, just um, leave a review. Positive reviews give us positive feedback so we know what to do with the podcast. And it gets the word out to everyone else out there. So when they look up firepitpodcast.com, we're the first ones that show up. And everyone can see how amazing we are. I mean, they already do, but more praise is always welcome. So just go on there, do what you got to do. Give us a thumbs up, the eggplant, the the lipstick, the what are, what are the other ones? The good just ones. Just stop. Wrap it up, Tom. Bring it home. Bring it home. On. Bring it home, like. Wow, it is weird being able to see you guys roll your eyes at the back <laughs> of your heads. Check us out. Be sure to join our Discord channel as well. Link in the episode's description at discord.me forward slash fire pit. Uh, you'll get notifications of new episodes. Even better, <laughs> you can engage in discussions with other fans of the show. And your wonderful hosts, the three of us, are also active on the Discord. So join in. Uh, the more people that are in the Discord, the more people talking, uh, the more interaction we can have, and the more fun that this podcast will continue to become. And uh, as always, you can email us for those long-winded messages where you just got to get it off your chest. Email us at curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. You can like our page on Facebook or follow us on Twitter. Our handle is at firepitcce. Both are linked in the episode's description as well. And from my end, I'd like to shout out two new followers and who are also personal shout-outs. Firstly, Liz. Uh, who not only became one of our many growing listeners, or joined our many growing listeners, but just started her own podcast. Uh, it's called Love Free or Die. It's a podcast about politics and polyamory. Um, she does it with a fellow named Jay, who is also brave and foolish enough to be the editor of their podcast. So I wanted to shout him slightly off as well. Shout him off, shout him out, shout him on. Yes. Thank you, Josh. So give them a shout out. Give them some love. Check them out. They're um, at lovefreepodcast.com. And similarly, I'd like to shout out Dino, who over the Thanksgiving weekend became our official 150th follower and listener. I was there at the bar with him when he uh, subscribed to pod, uh, to us on podbean.com. And I saw we were at 149 before him and we became 150 with him. So Dino, thank you very much. It's appreciated. And but to everyone else who listens out there who uh, joins us, whether on firepitpodcast.com or on the Facebook, just to check us out, whatever. We appreciate it. Thank you for checking us out and to keep the fire pits burning. Wow, I can see them checking out their watches. Wow. Who's next? Nigel. Yeah, we got to wake Dan up because we all fell asleep <laughs> with Tom and his freaking five hour long shout outs. Well, well, first off, I will, as always, uh, shout out Peggy, the OG friend of the channel. Today is also her birthday, so happy birthday, Peggy. Woo! Uh, I don't know how many years young you are, but I'm sure you, if I did know the actual number, you would not want me to say it on the air, so I will not. Uh, but happy birthday, Peggy. Uh, thanks for always listening to the show. Uh, also, um, it's no longer November, so I don't have to shout out my anniversary every week anymore. But you should anyways, because it's tradition. I'll go ahead and cover my bases and say happy anniversary to <laughs> my wife, even though it was weeks ago, uh, and I'm no longer, uh, it's no longer November, but, uh, we'll shout out to them. And also I will give a special shout out to our listeners because we are taking a small break after we're done with Ghostbusters because we'll be taking a holiday break. So, happy holidays to our fire pit faithful. Hope that this year you get to spend it with some family. I know a lot of people missed out on family gatherings last year because of COVID or the pandemic. So, uh, hopefully you get to get together with family this year. Have some fun. Eat some cookies, pie, cakes, turkey. Tom, edit that out. <laughs> Tom, edit that out. And uh, but that's all my shout-outs for today. Uh, Josh. I would like to shout-out uh, my parents for, you know, talking to me and being them. 
my parents. I do not have a lot of shout outs. Uh, Peyton, she started listening to our podcast. I hope you said you would. So if you did, <laughs> you better this be listening is your to it right out. now. If you didn't, you're never going to hear this. So shout out to you. Um, shout out to Danielle. She joined us on our Rocky episode. She's been helping me out with uh, other stuff. So shout out to you. Um, that's all I got. Oh, uh, I forgot. I, I want to amend a shout out. Also, well, speaking of birthdays, um, it's also my uh, niece's 18th birthday this weekend. So oh. special shout out to my niece. Get a job. So. <laughs> 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 oh, I do have one additional shout out. My other nephew, Trenton, I saw him when we went down to Florida on vacation. And uh, we had this very awesome interaction. We were at the beach. I was being making a total ass out of myself on a surfboard. And I was asking him, and I'm like, so how far down does this beach go? And he just looked at me deadpan, and he says, Florida? (laughs) I like them. I like them a lot. So, yes. Shout out to Trenton as well. So, since we're doing additional shout outs, let me pull up a list. And uh, let's go on to the outros here. So, what are we watching in, like, ten minutes, but next week for our listeners? Some movie about... Bust and Chops. I think it involves a farm. I recall a farm. So is this Green Acres? Are we watching... Are they finally making a live action movie of Green Acres? The Green Acres was live action, Tom. Green Acres is the place to be. Farm? Green Acres is the place for me. No one under 60 is going to Can we that. leave now, please? <laughs> We're going... <laughs> hey, Wilbur. That's Mr. Ed. We're going. That's literally. not Green Acres. <laughs> Jesus God. <laughs> this is the Dennis worst. the Menace. I'm just going off of old TV shows now. We're literally um, going to. And I want to keep interrupting Tom because that's yeah, funny. While Josh recites the Nick at Night lineup from 1995. Gilligan's Island. Boom. Ghostbusters Afterlife. Tune in next week. Until then, I've been Tom. And I've been Dan. And I've been Josh. Are you going to thank them for listening? Thank you for listening. It's been a minute. This has been a production of Curtain Call Entertainment, LLC. Good luck out there. (laughs) Green Acres is the place for me. Well, we've gone dumpster diving, picked on a bunch of random kids, and stopped a criminal plot to frighten people from their homes so they can gentrify the neighborhood. I still don't know what gentrify means. It's like Dan never left. You want some more dumpster Taco Bell, Dan Crow? Yeah, have some more dumpster Taco Bell. (coughs) And some dumpster Taco Bell for Tom. All right, so what's next on Dan Crow's list of unfinished business? I think there was something about getting revenge on some pigeons down at the park. I don't know, I need to point out. Where the fuck have you two been? Higher. You gotta go higher. Make sure the thumb's pressing. Just on. right on his windpipe, just like this, right? Yeah, just, yep. Yeah. Oh, shit, that's Dan's ghost. We've done it. Oh, my God, Dan, your soul, it's free. Why are you in a prison uniform and smell like gasoline? Joking. Oh, for f- fuck's sake. <laughs> Look. Oh, you let him go. I'm not dead, you morons. I've been trapped in the bottom of a ravine for like a week now. If one of you had bothered to move the crow off my desk, you would have seen me screaming at you on my computer. You know, that explains why your voice was coming from the computer speakers and not the crow. But why didn't you try calling us? I did, from prison. Neither of you check your phones? I just don't answer unknown numbers. Yeah, I mean, they only telemarketers call anyway, so it's... Yeah, plus, I don't like listening to voicemails. It gives me anxiety. You declared me dead! That was the easy part. But it was Tom. Don't look at me! Dan told me he was dead! It wasn't my fault, I... What? So wait, if you've been alive this whole time, then who's the crow supposed to be? <laughs> Tom, I, uh... I, you know, I'm not really convinced that's Dan... It could be like his twin brother, but we could have them fight. They could touch tips. Shut the fuck up. You leave me stranded for a week without checking on me. When I finally claw my way to freedom, not only do you declare me dead and cash out all my accounts, but you replace me with a goddamn crow. You know what? I think I'm done. For two seasons, I've been used, abused, dismissed, 
possessed. I have frozen myself, decapitated myself, crushed myself, almost killed myself, and all because of you two. You two are the common denominator in all of this. I don't know why I've stuck around this long, and I'm sure Sid don't know why I'm sticking around now. We cashed in your life insurance to pay off all your debt, though, and we don't ever have to work another day for the rest of our lives. Hello, boys! I'm back, and we're the best of friends. Let's never fight again. Hey! Oh, God, the crow! Oh, God, the crow's attacking us! <laughs> hey, Tom, he did that quote from Independence Day by Dennis Quaid. <laughs> <laughs> the crow's pecking out my eyes! No! Fuck you, Josh!